In this lesson, we will discuss and probabilities. And when we say and, we are referring to a category of probabilities, ones that contain the word and within the statement. I think it's worth noting that in a mathematical context, when we say and, this is synonymous with multiply. And maybe that idea will show up in this lesson. To describe these ideas, let's run the following probability experiment where a fair coin is flipped not once like in the last lesson, uh, but twice. In example one, it first says, what is the sample space for this experiment? So what are the total number of possible outcomes and what are they? I'll call it S is equal to, and if you flip a coin twice, you could get a heads and a heads. You could have first a head and then a tails. You could have a tails and a heads. Notice that these will be treated as different because there's a first and a second flip. And then lastly, we could have tails for both. And that's it. So in the sample space, these are the only possible things that can happen. And the number of those things is four. So I'll just note that the size, the number of things in the sample space is four. So even though there are two things listed here, this is one single event because running the experiment means you flipped a coin twice. So this heads, heads is one thing. Heads, tails is one thing that can happen and so on and so on. All right, so next it says, what is the probability of the event that the first flip is heads and then the second flip is also heads? So I'm going to define this as E for my event. I'd like to write it as a subset of the sample space. So it's heads first and heads second, which is this thing right here. So the event, it's definitely a subspace of this space because this thing is right here. And furthermore, the number of items in this event in the set is one. We now have everything that we need to figure out the probability that event E occurs. And we can use the formula from the previous lesson. And that formula said that if you want to know the probability of event E happening, it's the number of things in the set E divided by the number of things in the set, the sample space. It's the part out of the whole. There's one thing in E, there are four things in S, and that's our probability. It's one fourth. And if you'd like, you could also write this as a decimal. You could say that it's 0 0.25. Same thing. Uh, exactly. This is saying 25% if you convert the probability to a percent. But this makes sense. This thing happens one out of every four times, which is, in fact, 25%. So really, we don't need anything new to answer this problem. However, this approach can be quite lengthy, especially if you flip a coin, let's say, 10 times in a row. Your sample space is going to be huge. It's going to be inconvenient to list out everything in the sample space. But there is a formula that can speed up this process, which I'll discuss down here. This says, for independent events E1 and E2, independent meaning they have no effect on each other if one occurs, the probability that event E1 occurs followed by event E2 is, you would write it like this, the probability that event E1 happens and then E2, this is equal to the probability of E1 multiplied by the probability of E2. And this is what is meant by an and probability. If first E1 happens and then E2 happens, we can multiply those two probabilities together to get our final answer. So the question is, how could you use this formula to solve this problem and hopefully arrive at the same answer of 1 fourth or 0.25 and as a percent, 25%? It would work like this. I'm going to define E1 to be the event that you flip heads. So we flip the coin and we get a heads. And then E2, I'm actually going to define it to be the same thing. You flip a coin and you get heads. So you could think of this event E, where you get heads and heads, as saying E1 happens and then E2 happens. So event E that we just solved for, 
that's the same thing as writing E1 and then E2, or if you'd like, you can just put E1 and then E2. Our ultimate goal was to find the probability of E, and we did it, and it took quite a bit of work. And somehow that should relate to E1 and E2, their probabilities independently. Do you know the probability of E1 if you flip a coin and you get heads? We definitely know this. If you flip a coin once, the probability that it comes up heads is one half, or 0.5, or as a percent, 50%. What's the probability of E2? The exact same thing. It's also one half. If you flip a coin once and then you do it again, those are independent events. They should have no effect on one another. If you put all this together, what we were trying to do in example one was find the probability of E. That is the probability that you flip heads and then you flip heads again. Well, this formula says you can just multiply these two probabilities together separately. This is the same thing as probability of E1 times the probability of E2. And these two by themselves are much easier to figure out. In fact, you can put a half here and multiply by a half. So the probability of E is 1 half times 1 half. What's 1 half times 1 half? If you multiply the numerators, you get 1. If you multiply the denominators, you get a fourth, which is, again, 0 0.25. So the probability you get from using this formula is this, and it matches up with the process that we had in the previous slide. So if you can make this observation ahead of time, this is a much faster way to approach the problem instead of writing out a sample space, counting how many things are in it, defining a subspace, counting those number of things, and then dividing them. Also, we can now generalize this. This formula holds true for not just two events, but any number of independent events. So you could have events E1, E2, to any number EN. And as long as these are all independent, meaning they have no effect on one another, then the probability that E1 happens followed by E2 followed by all the way up to EN, that's equal to the probability of E1 times the probability of E2, all the way down the line until you get to the last probability. So that being said, we can now ask a question like, well, what if you flipped a coin six times in a row? What's the probability that you would get heads all six times? So I'll try to fit this in here, but what if you flip a coin six times? What's the probability that you get all heads? We know that for each individual flip, the probability is gonna be a half, just like we had up here. And according to this formula, if you have six of these things in a row, you're just taking a half and you're multiplying it together six times. We can actually just jump right to the answer. Basically, it's a half times a half times a half, then three more times a half times a half times a half. So that would be the probability of flipping a head six times in a row. I'm going to get a number for this. I'm just curious. Six. Two, okay. That's one over 64 as a probability. If you want to convert that into a decimal, that is, well, I'll round it. It's 0 0.016. And if you convert that to a percent, that's like 1.6%, which is, you know, very unlikely. You can try it out if you want. Um, every 100 times that you run this experiment, you should expect it to be about two times that this event would occur. So that is pretty unlikely. Anyway, the thing to note with what we just did here is this was pretty quick. If you were to take this approach to answering this question, it would take a very long time. The sample space would be huge. You might miss something when you're listing out all the elements. And so therefore, this is just a much faster approach to take for solving this problem. Okay, so let's uh, apply this formula in a few examples. In example one, a six-sided die is rolled some number of times, and that number will depend on the events that appear in parts A through D.
The goal is to find the probability of these events. And let's start with part A. The event is rolling a four first and a one second. So here we're rolling a six sided die twice. In the previous lesson, we would have listed out all the elements in the sample space, that is rolling a die twice. There's 36 things that you'd have to list and I don't wanna do that. So instead, the approach I'm going to take is, since we have two events, if you separate them by this and, I'm going to let E1 represent rolling a four for the first event. And then I'll let E2 represent rolling a one for the second event. These two events are independent. What happens when you first roll should have no effect on what happens when you roll second. And for this reason, we're looking for the probability of E1 happening and then E2 happening, which, as we saw last time, is the probability of E1 multiplied by the probability of E2. So if we can figure out these probabilities separately, then we can multiply them together to get the final answer. So here, if you roll a die once, what's the probability that you get a 4? This one should be much simpler to figure out. Let's see. The probability of rolling a 4 if you are just rolling a die once is there's exactly one way you can get a 4. That's if you roll a 4. How many ways or how many things can happen when you roll a die once? Six things, because there's six sides to this die. That's it. That's the probability of rolling a 4. What's the probability of rolling a 1? It's exactly the same. There's exactly one way you can roll 1, but there's six possible things that can happen. So this one is also 1 sixth. So what happens here is, to get our answer, the probability of E1 happening and then E2 happening is 1 sixth times 1 sixth. And if you multiply the tops, you get 1. In the denominator, 6 times 6 is 36. And that is the exact probability, 1 over 36. If you'd like a decimal, I'll round to a couple of places. That's 0 0.028. So those are both probabilities, one's exact, one is a decimal approximation. As a percent, that's 2.8%, so not a likely event. In part B, we have rolling an odd number first and then rolling a number greater than four second. So we have an and probability, and these separately are certainly independent events. I think it might be nice here for to at least list the sample space of rolling a die once, just for the visual of it. So if you roll a die once, the things that can happen is you roll a one, two, three, a four, a five, or a six. So I'll just note that this is if you roll a six-sided die once. Going back to this problem, event E1 that's rolling an odd number. And then E2 is going to be rolling a number greater than 4. If we want the probability of E1 happening and then E2, again, we're using this multiplication formula. It's the probability of the first multiplied by the probability of the second. And finding those individually will be a little bit easier. So what's the probability of E1? That you roll an odd number first. Well, there's six things that can happen, so that'll go in the denominator of your fraction. And if you want the number to be odd, it could be a 1, a 3, or a 5. That's three total choices. So it's 3 over 6, which reduces to half. What's the probability of E2, if we consider that all on its own? Okay, a number greater than 4 seconds, that means you can get a 5 or a 6. That's two out of six things and that reduces to a third. So the answer to this question is the probability exactly, it's one half times one third, which equals one times one, two times three is six. That's the probability. I think we could approximate this with a decimal. Uh, let's see, this is about 0 0.167. Those are both probabilities. One's approximate, one is exact. As a percent, that is about 16.7%. So a more likely event than this one here. But that makes sense because we are including more things in both events. In part C, 
it says the event is rolling a six, six times in a row. So here we've gone from just two rolls to six. Uh, the event for each one is the same. It's just getting a six. So even though there are six events, E1, E2, all the way to E6, they're the same thing. And so I'll call them simply E. We want to know the probability of these events. So I'll just do that once. Uh, the probability of rolling a six is, well, there's one way that can happen out of six total ways. So the probability of any one of these events is one out of six. When it comes to computing the probability, that's the probability of E1, E2, all the way down to E6. You're taking this number, you are multiplying it to itself six times. Here's a shorter way to write this. You could write 1 6 times 1 6 times 1 6 six times in a row. We defined exponents to do this for us when we have a lot of multiplication. That is 1 6 to the power of 6. So you're taking this thing and you're multiplying it six times in a row. And this thing's just a little bit faster to put into a calculator. What is 6 to the power of 6? Whoa, that is... 46,656. When I multiplied this out, that's 1 over 46656. The way I got this number is, I didn't type in this fraction. I just typed in 6, and I raised that to the 6th power, and it gave me this number here. That's the probability, and that can't be reduced. Um, yeah, as a decimal, it's going to be pretty small. Yeah, um, this is approximately, if we were to round, that's 0 0.0000214. So this fraction is equal, well, approximately equal to this decimal, and those are both probabilities. What is that as a percent? Uh, that's 0 0.00214%. Um, extremely unlikely. That's a very small probability, very, very close to zero. And in the last part here, um, the events are rolling an even number with this die and then flipping a coin and getting heads. Like we, these aren't even related, but actually that's okay. There's nothing that says this couldn't be your experiment. You roll a die and then you flip a coin. Um, so how do we address this? the same way we've done the previous parts. What we'll do is we'll define an event E1. E1 for me is going to be rolling an even number in this scenario. And then my event E2 is going to be this uh, experiment of flipping a coin, but you get heads in doing so. These are certainly independent events. They should have no effect on one another. If you want to know the probability of E1 happening and then E2 happens, It'll still be the probability of E1 multiplied by the probability of E2. So we have to find these separately. Start with this one here. If you roll a die once, what's the probability that you get an even number? Well, that can happen one, two, three ways on a total of six. So the probability of E1 is three out of six, and that's equal to a half. The same as if you were to roll an odd number. Now, this one seems different because now we're talking about flipping a coin. That's the event of E2. What's the probability of flipping a coin and getting heads? It's a half. There's two choices. The one we want is heads. I have a possible two choices of either heads or tails. So the probability of both of these things are equal. They're both a half. To find the probability of E1 happening and then E2 is one half multiplied by one half. That is one-fourth as a decimal. That is 0.25. Both are probabilities. And that is 25%. Example 3 says, one card is dealt from a shuffled 52-card deck. The card is then replaced into the deck. The deck is shuffled. And then another card is dealt. What is the probability of being dealt an ace first and a diamond second. All right, let's start there. Um, with this very first question, it's a and probability. 
So I'm going to define an E1 and an E2 for event 1 and event 2. And so here we're talking about just this first question. Okay. Event 1 is being dealt an ace. So dealt an ace. And then the second is being dealt a suit of diamonds. With those events in mind, we need to know the probability of each event. All right, uh, the probability of being dealt an ace out of the total 52 cards in the sample space, there's four possible ways. So this is four over 52. That reduces to one over 13, okay? Uh, event two, being dealt a diamond means you could get any one of these things and there's 13 out of 52. But just by using the logic up here, this is one out of a possible four different suits. So you can really say that this is equal to a fourth. Both would be fine. We want the probability that we have E1 occurring and then E2. And so we can go to our formula. It says the probability of E1 and E2 happening is the product of the two. Um, it's okay here if you actually just put these two next to each other without that multiplication X symbol in between because this also means multiplication. And if we do this, if we multiply those together, uh, that's a 13th times a fourth. And that product is 13 times four, which is 52. That is one over 52. Um, if I want to approximate this as a decimal, you know, that's roughly 0 0.019. And that is as a percent about 1.9%. So not a likely occurrence. So this looks pretty good as uh, our answers. But really, we have to just be careful about one thing. This formula applies only if these are independent events. What do you think? Are they? Um, does the first event have an effect on what would happen in the second event? These two are actually, in fact, independent, and that means that this formula did give us the right answer. The reason these events are independent of each other is because after the first card is dealt, it's put back into the deck. And then the deck is shuffled, and we're like starting over from the beginning. If you were to deal a card and then not put that card back into the deck, that would have an effect on the probability of event two because there would be one less card, meaning we'd have to be careful about this probability. So these two first sentences are really important. They're telling you that the first event should have no effect on the second one. So by the time you're going to start the second event, it's really like you're starting over from the beginning. All right, so now for the other part of this question, what about, so we're looking for again another probability, the probability of being dealt an ace of spades and then a diamond. So for this second part, I will define E1 as the event we are dealt um, a specific card, the ace of spades. And then for E2, we are dealt a diamond. Um, what do you think ahead of time? Do you think that the probability is going to be bigger or smaller than this? Uh, let's see. The probability of event E occurring, E1 I mean, uh, well, there's only one way this can happen. If you're given this card here, I have a possible 52. So that's 1 over 52. The probability of event 2, well, that's actually the same thing that was happening here in this part of the question. So we still get one fourth. That is also one fourth. Uh, notice the only difference between this question and this question is this allowed for four possible aces and this allows for one specific ace. It should be that this probability is a smaller number. Again, these events are independent. I'm going to jump to saying here the probability of event E1 and then E2 happening is simply this times this. 
that's 1 over 52 multiplied to 1 over 4. If we multiply those two together, 52 times 4 is 208. This is 1 over 208. I'll approximate that as a decimal. Okay, uh, I get that this is about 0 0.00481. If you convert that into a percent, that is 0.481%, if I just move the decimal point twice. Uh, this is significantly smaller than this. This is a less likely occurrence, but that makes sense in the context of the problem as well. In example four, for the above spinner, it is equally likely that this pointer will land on any one of these six regions, and we'll assume that if the pointer lands on a boundary, we'll just spin again like it never happened. Uh, we are assuming that the pointer is spun twice, and if that happens, find the probability that the pointer lands on a yellow region first, and then a blue region second. So in dealing with this first part of the question, I'm going to define two events. So we're saying it first lands on yellow and then it lands on blue. When we encountered a problem like this in the previous lesson, since the number of blue, red, and yellow regions is different, it actually is helpful to label these regions as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and define a sample space much like rolling a six-sided die. These are the things that can happen. So let's define events E1 and E2 for this very first part of the question. If event E1 is we're landing on a yellow region, the way I've split up the region means you get either a 3 or a 6 out of the possible 1 through 6 choices. And then a blue region, so that's E2, that's like saying you get a 1 two, or a four. And perceived this way, it makes it a little bit easier to figure out the probability of those events separately. So E1 and E2. For E1, the probability of a yellow region, that's two ways it could happen out of a total six ways. So that's two over six, which is the same thing as one over three. For this event, there are three ways that it can happen of a total of six, so that's three out of six, which reduces to a half. The probability that E1 happens and then E2 happens is the product of these two numbers. It's one-third times one-half, the exact probability being one-sixth. As a decimal, that's about 0 0.167. That's also a probability, but it's an estimate. And as a percent, that is 16.7%. Okay, and then for this next part, it says, if the pointer is spun three times, find the probability that the spinner lands on a red region, then a yellow region, and then a red region. I'll define three events for this one. So we got E1 occurs, E2 occurs, and then E3 occurs. For E1, the probability of landing on a red region well, the way we define that as a sample space is 5 happens. And the probability that 5 happens is 1 out of the total 6 ways. For E2, landing on a yellow region, that's either landing on 3 or 6, that is 2 out of the 6 ways, which is 1 out of 3 ways. And E3 is the same thing as E1, so again, that's landing on a 5. Therefore, the probability of E3 is 1 sixth. To now compute the probability that we have E1, then E2, then E3, as these are independent events, is going to be the product of these three fractions. So a sixth times a third times one sixth. And if we multiply those together, 6 times 6 is 36, times 3 is 108. Okay, 108. 
I'll get my calculator here. Um, we can write this as a decimal too, one divided by 108. And that's approximately equal to 0, 0.00. I'll go 926. And if we convert this into a percent by moving the decimal point two places, that's 0.926%, which is an unlikely event. And that is it for this problem.